Hi everyone and welcome to learn A-level biology for free with Miss Estrick. In this video I'm going to be going through sampling techniques which falls under estimating population size and for AQA this is required practical 12. So first of all recapping from GCSE it's thinking about why do we actually have to take samples in order to estimate the population size. And the reason for that is if you were asked to count every single daisy in this field here, it would take you absolutely ages and you'd probably make lots of mistakes, either missing daisies or recounting the same daisies. So by using sampling techniques, if you use them properly and follow a selection of rules, it's far more time efficient and often you actually end up with a more accurate answer. So the golden rules are, in order to make sure that your samples are accurately representing the population, you would have to, in this example here, because it is a uniform distribution of daisies, you would be doing random sampling, and that's to avoid any bias. You're not deliberately just selecting areas to take your samples from. If you had an uneven distribution, and I'll go through examples of that later, then you would use a line transect, and that would be systematic sampling rather than random. But whichever you do, it has to be a large sample to make sure it is representing the population. And AQA typically say large is anything over 30. So just use 30 as your standard answer in an exam. So accurately representing the population is a really common phrase that comes up. Either you could be asked, how do you make sure your samples accurately represent the population? And it'd be random sampling and large samples most of the time. Or you could be asked, why must you take a large number of samples? And in which case it'd be to make sure you are accurately representing the population. So here's just a summary flow diagram to help you work out um, which type of sampling you'd be writing about, writing about in an exam questions. Because so far, the main way that required practical 12 has been assessed in the exams is long answer questions where you are given a scenario and you then have to write the method. And step one, you have to know which type of sampling you are writing the method for. So you have two initial options. Are you sampling the population of motile organisms? And that means organisms which are moving a lot, so most animals. Or are you going to be sampling slow moving like a snail or non-motile like plants or certain um, animals you might find in rock pools that don't move? So depending on which example you've been given in an exam question, we'll let you know whether you are sampling with a quadrat or if you're using the mark release recapture method. Now that's the end of it for mark release recapture, but for sampling using a quadrat, you then have to work out are you randomly sampling? And that is only the case if you are given an example in the question where it's uniform distribution. So it could be uniform distribution of daisies in a field or grass in a field, or it might be uneven distribution. So it might be looking at the distribution of animals from the shoreline of the beach all the way back to the sand or the rocky shore. And that would be uneven distribution. And that would be a line transect. Now in this video, I'm only going through quadrats and random and line transects. I'm not doing mark release recapture. That'll be in a later video. So a recap on quadrats. You're probably very familiar. They're normally 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters and they can either be open on the inside or gridded to make 100 squares. And if we focus on random sampling first, so we said this is what you would use if it is a plant or a very slow moving animal and you have evenly distributed plant species. So this could be a four or five mark description of the method and it's really particular in the mark scheme, the language you use. So step one, you lie two tape measures at a right angle to create a gridded area. And the parts I've put in bold are the bits you would have to have in that answer for just one mark. For the second mark, this is where you would then be using a random number generator. So for example, a calculator to generate two values which will act as coordinates. 
And in this case, I've got the value 9 and 11. And you'd need two people to walk. And where you meet is where you place your quadrat. So that would be your mark 2, random number generator to create two coordinates. Then you place your quadrat. Now, for mark number 3, you would need to describe either collecting data via density, percentage cover, or local frequency. And it's normally the first two. And the details of that is coming up in a few minutes in this video. The final mark is you would need to repeat steps one to three at least 30 times and calculate a mean. So that's your random sampling method. Now you could have, as I said, a line transect. And this is again, if you have slow moving or no movement in your organism, but it's if you have uneven distribution. And common examples are on beaches. So either a sandy shore or a rocky shore, or if you want to see the impact a path is having or a river. So in these two examples, we'd, if we wanted to know the impact of this river on the distribution of these buttercups, you'd need to place your line transect and then we'd take measurements all the way along to see how the distribution of daisies, the population size, changes in accordance to proximity to the river. Or you might be interested in looking at species richness or the population size of one species going from right here in the rock pools of the shoreline all the way back further up the beach. So line transects, as we said, for when you have this uneven distribution. And the importance of that is it gives you a sample at different sections along the way so you don't miss any key pieces of information. If you did random sampling in either of these, because it's random, by chance, all of your coordinates might end up in this rock pool section and you'd gain no data on the sandy area. Or it could be lots around right by the river and none further away. And that's not going to help you get your answer. The next thing you need to know is the two different types of transects. And you can have a belt transect, which isn't interrupted. And that is when you place your quadrat at every position along the tape measure. Or an interrupted belt transect, which is where you place the quadrat at intervals. Now, you would most often use an interrupted belt transect if you are measuring a very, very long distance because it saves time. Or if at first glance, it looks like if you were to place it every single position, you're not actually going to see much difference. So you might think that it's more useful to place it every five meters or every two meters because you need that distance before you can actually see a difference. So last thing with the transect is the description of the method, which again would be a four to five mark question, most likely. And it's this one that students normally give a really vague answer. And I'll point out the key marking points, which are often missed out. And the first one is a typical mark, which is missed out. And that is the precise description of where you place your transect. So if it's on a rocky shore, you have to place your transect at a right angle to the shoreline. And I've just indicated where the shoreline is. So that is where the water is moving up. So that is your shoreline. And this green line that I've put over the top is representing my tape measure at a right angle to that shoreline. So step two and three. This is now where you'd be describing how you would know where to place your quadrats. And you'd either go for the interrupted belt transect, which I have here, or if you're going for every position, then you describe that one. And again, when you place it, you would need to say what type of data are you collecting, density, percentage cover, or local frequency, which is coming up in a few minutes. The last one, again, is repeat by um, another 30 times, or 30 in total. But this is another one where you have to be really precise with how you describe the position of your repeats. So you need to repeat by placing at least another 30 transects along the beach. But again, you have to emphasize at right angles to the shoreline. So I fitted on here another three repeats. You need to ideally have 30 going all the way along that beach at right angles to the shoreline. So the final thing then is 
how you know which method you're going to use to count or collect the data inside of the quadrat. And I'm going to go through three key methods. So number one, local frequency. This is where you are counting the number of squares um, which have the species present. But because we have 100 squares, we represent it as a percentage. So I've already put on this diagram in blue all of the squares out of the 100 where the plant species is occupy, occupying part of a square. And that is 35 squares in this example. So we would say that when we place this quadrat down, we'd be recording 35% is the local frequency of this quadrat. You would then repeat 30 times, calculate a mean, and whatever the percentage is, you would use as your estimate for the entire field. The next option is density, and you would normally use an open quadrat for this. And this is where you're counting the number of one species in a given area, um, and you're counting the actual number. So in this example, I've counted there are 11, and we need to know how many we have in the entire field. So there is a bit of maths involved in this one. So if we have 11 in a quadrat, which is 0.5 metres by 0.5 metres, that is 11 in 0.25 metres squared area. However, the size of the field in this example is 280 metres squared. So we then need to work out how many there would be in the entire field. So to do this, step one is working out how many times does your quadrat fit in to the size of the field. So the size of the field is 280 divided by the size of the area of the quadrat. And we know there are 11 in the area of the quadrat, so that's why I did multiply by 11. So in this example, in the entire field, there's 12,320 daisies. That is our estimate. Now with density, again, you would have to have done 30 repeats, calculated a mean, and then you would do this sum. Final method is the percentage cover. And this one is where you would have to estimate how many full squares out of the 100 are completely covered by the daisy. And to be able to do that, you have to be able to visualize and estimate if you were to squash all of those plants together, how many full squares are covered. So it is quite tricky. Sometimes people do this by tearing up pieces of paper um, over the actual plants, and then they put all of the paper together to try and make this easier. So you're not doing it visually in your mind, you're actually using pieces of paper. And from this, I estimated there are about 18 full squares covered. So my percentage cover would be 18%. Now, just having a look at these, each time I've used exactly the same data. So I've used exactly the same position and number of daisies. And we have very different answers for percentage cover and local frequency. So that's the final thing I'm going to go through is the pros and cons of these three methods. So you know when to use each one, because that's another thing you could be asked for required practical 12 is which method would be most appropriate for the example they've given you. So local frequency, the advantages are it's very quick. You're just looking at how many of the squares is the plant present in. So it's a useful one to use if you need to survey a large area very quickly. It's also useful if the plant species that you are surveying is too difficult to identify as an individual species. So for example, moss, you can't really tell where one moss plant starts and where one ends. Or if there are too many to count, for example, grass, you couldn't count all of the grass species in a field. Instead, this could be a good alternative. The downside, poor accuracy. And the two key reasons for that is number one, it doesn't take into account that in this section here, we actually have plant species overlapping. And it looks like there's four there, but there might be more underneath. We might have many other daisies overlapping, so you can't count them. The other example is if the plant that you're counting is very, very big 
and one plant so one individual might occupy almost the entire quadrat and that would give you a really high percentage local frequency even though the population size might actually be very small so it can be misleading depending on the size of the plant so the next one density this is more accurate in comparison but it's only more accurate if you can easily distinguish an individual plant and there's not too many to count so daisies is actually a good example to um, of a plant species to use for density you can also use this method if you are asked to estimate the species richness which is how many species there are how many different species there are in a given area at a given time so in that case you'll just be counting how many different species there are in your quadrat the downside is it is more time consuming so lastly percentage cover so it is quicker than density and it's more useful than density if you are going to find it too difficult to identify an individual organism or there's too many to count so it does have its place the downside is it's subjective so i looked at that and said it was 18 percent you might have looked at it and thought well no i don't agree i think that's 20 percent so you do get because it is your opinion and your estimate it is subjective and that limits the accuracy again it doesn't take into account overlapping plants and the size of the plant so that is it for sampling and the types of questions you get for required practical 12.